YouTube channel is The Jax, J A X, all one word, The Jax, and then Space Summit, The Jax Summit. And uh, it should bring up our page, and if not, then of course, just watch us here on Facebook. Um, if you want to say amen or anything that's feedback online there, that's not negative, I don't need the negative, but if you can't hear me or something like that, you can let us know. I've got Graham, my son, here with me tonight trying to help me to do this right. We just set up the YouTube channel, and uh, there's also a link to that on our church website. Well, I take that back. I think we changed it up today, so we have to put the new one on the church website. But if you haven't seen the new church website, we've been working on that, and it's jacksummitchurch.com. And that's all one word, and we put on links for giving, links to our Facebook, links to our Instagram, and then we'll have the correct link to our YouTube, hopefully this evening or tomorrow. Now, tomorrow, I'm going to try to stay offline. I'm going to try to just spend time with the Lord, reading, seeking God, and not being online, because I've been online a lot. So, uh, if you would like to turn to your Bibles, if you have your Bibles, that's always a good idea. If you're at home, uh, where else would you be? You're probably not watching this in the car. Take out your Bible and turn to Psalms chapter 3. That's where I'm going to start tonight. Psalms 3. But I want, to, I want to pray with you first. Lord, thank you for this night, and thank you for every person who is tuning in, and every person that will see this, and every person that shares it, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray for the body of Christ at this time. I pray for our church, Lord, the Summit Church, and everybody that makes up this congregation. I pray for health. I pray, God, for peace. I pray for joy, I pray for open doors for ministry, I pray for your provision, and I thank you for it, Father. Let every person be a, a vessel, an ambassador of rivers of living water, of Christ's life, that people would be walking in your peace and in your power in such a great degree that they could give that to other people as they encounter them throughout the day. We pray for all of our health workers, those that we're related to, those that are part of our church, and an extended family beyond that. God, we pray for every health worker on the front lines of this battle. I pray, oh God, that you would keep them healthy, give them strength. Anybody that's inflicted with a virus, Father, we pray that you would heal them in the name of Jesus Christ. We release your healing into this land and into anyone who is suffering with this disease or rather this virus and anyone father that needs your healing touch we release healing because you are the wonderful healer and we bless your name tonight and we thank you for the presence of god that is is good and wonderful we thank you father that we can call upon you amen so i, I i've heard a couple of different messages today and this one word came up like two or three different times and so I started thinking about that word and praying about it and then reading in the Bible about it. And the word is simply, it's a real simple word. It's called pause. Pause. Like you're watching a television show and you hit the pause button. Or maybe you're watching something on the computer and you hit the pause, pause button. Same thing on your phone. Pause button. Why do we hit the pause? Because we're watching something and... We are interested in it, but there's something else we have to do, right? If, you, if, if you're pausing a TV show, it's probably because, one, there's noise in the room, and you can't hear what's being said, and you're interested. Two, you just want to go to the kitchen and get a snack. Or maybe three, you have to go to the bathroom. So you get up and go, and you come back, and then you hit the play button, and you watch... And there could be other reasons, but you get the point. Something is important or desired more than what you're viewing at the moment. And so you pause it so you can take care of the thing that you're more 
urgently needing to do, maybe you forgot to do, something like that, you hit the pause button. Well, what do we do when God hits the pause button in our life, in our society, in our world? Um, everything is paused, you know, the NBA, uh, PGA Golf, there's a dozen other things that have been canceled that are much more important, things like workplaces that have been closed, people losing money, and uh, all of a sudden, it, everything just comes to a screeching halt, bam, it's paused. So there must be something that God is wanting to do in the midst of what Satan means for evil, Romans 8, 28, one of our key verses, hey, in the midst of whatever evil comes, God will cause it good to come out of it. All things work together for good for those that love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. Not all things are good, but God can bring good out of any situation, no matter how dark and how bleak it is. And this is dark for a lot of people because some people have died, some people have lost their job, some people's businesses are on shaky ground, and uh, it's a traumatic thing. And then there's the church gathering. We're not able to gather and do the things we normally do. God has paused it all. So I want to read to you. Uh, this is Psalm 3. I'll get to what do we do when God pauses it in a minute. But I want you to see this in Psalm 3 and verse 1. I'm going to read the whole chapter. It's only seven or eight verses. Yeah, eight verses. Look at what it says here. Psalm 1. A psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. So his own son had rebelled against him. There's a kingdom-wide rebellion. They're trying to kick David off the throne, and his son is going to take the throne. David has loved Absalom. He hasn't done anything, everything right with Absalom, but he loves him. And this is how it ends up. Absalom rebels, David is fleeing, and this says, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. And he says this, Lord, how are they increased that trouble me? Many there be that rise up against me. Listen to the next verse. Many there be which say of my soul, there is no help for him in God. Now you know that's a lie of the devil. When people are saying there's no hope and there's no help, there's no help in God. There's no help for you even in God. And then there's this curious word, Selah, which appears again and again throughout the Psalms. And it means pause, a suspension. Literally, it meant a suspension of music, an arrest, a pause. So he says, Lord, how do they increase the trouble of me? Many there be that rise up against me. Many there be which save my soul. There is no help for him in God. Selah. So he's going to pause there. No music. He's going to rest and stay in that spot for a moment. And then he picks up in verse 3. But you, O Lord, are a shield for me, my glory and the lifter of my head. So when you pause in the presence of God, when you're crying out to him, what happens is you begin to glorify him. But you, O God, are a shield for me. You're my glory. You're the lifter up of my head. I cried unto the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. Selah. There he says it again. This word occurs all throughout the Psalms, and it always means the same thing. Suspension. Pause. Wait. Rest in this spot for a moment. Verse 5. Okay, now I've cried to the Lord. He's heard me. Look at verse 5. I laid down and slept, and I awoke. For the Lord sustained me. Don't let the enemy cost you your sleep and your rest because you're worried. God said, don't, don't worry about tomorrow. And so what we have to do is, all right, I have to really take that into heart and not worry about tomorrow. I have to trust in the Lord with all of my heart. Well, all of this is linked together. Each time he pauses, now he says, okay, I cried to the Lord, now I can sleep. And guess what? I slept and the Lord woke me up. He sustained me. I will not be afraid of ten thousands of people that have set themselves against me all about. 
Verse 7, Arise, O Lord, save me, O my God, for you have smitten all my enemies upon the cheekbone. You have broken the teeth of the ungodly. Salvation belongs to the Lord. Your blessing is upon the people. Selah. Each time he directs us in the psalm to rest, to pause, to suspend what we're doing. I'm in the middle of a song. I know, just stop for a minute. And think about what you've just said. I'm in the middle of a prayer. I know. Stop. Hear your words. Are you praying in agreement with Jesus Christ? I talked a lot about that. Let your prayers agree with what the Bible says about you. I have a glorious inheritance in Jesus. The word of God tells me to count it all joy. Various trials, count it all joy. Because God has something glorious to add to your life. It's a divine upgrade. But in order to do all that, you've got to rest in God. So if you're praying but complaining to God... You're not in sync with what the Holy Spirit wants to pray through you. So you could take it to God and say whatever it is you want. Okay, I, you know, but then get in sync with God. If you're complaining, if you're down, pause. Hit the pause button. Say, okay, how do I get in sync with you, Lord? Start praising him. Start exalting him. You, O oh Lord, are my glory. And the lifter of my head, glory is this weightiness of God. It's the abundance of God. You are my abundance. You are the glory of my life. And you lift up my head. Remember what we've talked about Sunday, Job 22. Men are cast down and you will say there is a lifting up, a lifting up of the head. My head inside and out. I can look unto the Lord because he is my glory and my strength. So, I wanted you to see this. David was under attack. People say there's no help. There's no, that literally means there's no victory, there's no deliverance, there's no salvation in God. There is total salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is total hope for you. Physically, financially, as the church, there's hope in Jesus. I heard a minister saying today, one of the messages I listened to, he said, God is going to bring us through this, but our goal is not just to go through it. Our goal is to be better off when we have gone through it, when we get to the other side. And that's what rejoicing in all things is all about. Rejoice not because of the rough things, but because Jesus is Lord, because he is your glory, he is your salvation, he is the lifter of your head, arise. I just love the way the psalm progresses, and each time he pauses, he enters with a new thought. They say there's no help, but Lord, you're my shield and my glory and the lifter of my head. I cried to the Lord, and he heard me out of his holy hill. I'm going to rest in that. Man, just do that. When you cry unto the Lord, just, okay, I'm going to pause right there. Thank you, Lord, that you've heard my cry. He hears your cry when you pray. Don't let the enemy tell you he doesn't hear you. Your prayers aren't effective. You're not holy enough. It's the throne of grace. You're approaching God solely by his grace, his forgiveness, his life in you. So don't. Don't let the enemy bombard you. I cried to the Lord with my voice, and he heard me out of his holy hill. And just stay there. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that you've heard me. And then be determined as you pray that you're going to see the salvation of the Lord. Then he said, now that I know the Lord has heard me, I can sleep. I can rest. I can get what I need because God will sustain me. Now listen, we've always sung songs and talked about the Lord is my provider. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Now is the time to walk in that. God always has a plan of provision for the righteous, even when the brook is dry, even when one source has stopped. So, okay, 
that got me on. I don't know how long I'm going to go tonight. Not really long. Not the normal. We, if we were here talking together and you were asking me questions, we'd go a minimum of an hour. But since it's just me talking and you're just sitting there listening, it makes it a little more difficult to tie into for a great length of time. So I want to get you, okay, pause, sila, rest, stop. God has pressed the pause button. Okay, so that was my next thing. Where did God press pause in the scripture? What happened when God stopped the way things were and started to do something else? And there's all kinds, now there's tons of stories about this, where God stops one thing and leads them into something new. And I just wrote down a few things. This time of pause is to consecrate yourself to God. It's to do something that you have not been doing. It is time to get into the Bible and to get into the presence of God and to, to take your family there. It is time not to just try to cope and get through, but it is time to ask God, okay, God, why have you hit the pause button in me? Why am I here? What, what do you want to transform about my life and through me and my church, my congregation? There's a lot of things that God can transform. And I pray that one of them will be is we'll never, ever take for granted coming to church together and worshiping the Lord ever again. Because we have treated it as optional. Very optional. We put other things before it. All sorts of things we put before it. We decide a lot of times on Sunday whether we're going to go or not. Because why? Well, if I don't go this week, I can go next week. And God says, you know what? I'm not pleased with your attitude in approaching me. Pause. Now you can't do it. What do you think of that? Because you say, well, Jim, where are you getting this from? Well, in Amos, they said, I can worship God any way I want to worship God. And he said, I want a spotless, perfect lamb for the sacrifice. And they brought him any old lamb. And he says, you, bring, you, you purposely seek out the worst, the one that's most sick, the one that's crippled, and that's what you offer me. And if you read Amos, you see God speaking to them in a very powerful, passionate way. He says, look, if you keep giving me your leftovers and your garbage, I'm going to give you what you've given to me. And he talks about how he would do that if they didn't bring a sacrifice. Now, we know that Christ forgives us of our sin and he makes us holy so we can present ourselves holy unto the Lord. But see, what we do is we treat that as optional. Well, since God loves me and I'm under grace and he's made me holy, he gets it, he understands. Listen, God never says, worship me how you want. He says, worship me with your whole being. Love me with your whole being. And worship literally means enthroning something in your life. The thing you count as the most worthy is what you worship. And unfortunately, God has not been at the top of many of our lists. So I pray that this would cause us to reset and say, I'm going to make worshiping God a priority. I'm going to make ministry to the Lord a priority. Because how quickly everything can change economically. All the stuff we spend years and years and years trying to work for, but not the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all those things can be taken away in just a moment. But what you do for God, he says, that's what's going to endure. So when God hits pause, okay, here's three examples in the scripture. Genesis 22, I'll read the scripture. Genesis 22, 10 through 12. Graham, is anybody watching? Am I talking to myself? Yeah, we got about 23 okay, on there. Good. Just checking because, you know, I can't hear anybody saying amen, <laughs> oh me. Hey, nobody's even walking in and out while I'm talking. That's, that's unusual, but that's because nobody's here. So I'd rather have people walk in and out than have nobody here. So it's really different talking to an empty building just doing this online. Okay, so Genesis 22, 10 through 12. Then he, this is Abraham reached out his hand and took his knife to slay his son, who was about to sacrifice Isaac. But the angel of the Lord called out from heaven, Abraham, Abraham, here I am, he replied. 
Do not lay a hand on the boy, he said. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. So God spares the life of Isaac, but that's not all. He makes a promise to Abraham. Because you have honored me and trusted me, I'm going to bless your seed. So much so that your seed is going to be a blessing to the entire world. And that's what he has done. God has blessed us with Israel, with the Jewish people. They have done so many innovations and great things. I don't have time, but you can look up a list. It's phenomenal. And it covers a cross-section of business, entertainment, uh, technology, medicine, architecture. The list goes on and on. God said, I'm going to make your seed bless the entire world. Why? Because he was willing to lay down Isaac. Now that's important. I, I know I heard a minister say this, but I can't remember who, so I can't give him credit. They said, God always wants to bless us. But what he doesn't want is for us to try to hold on to the blessing when he wants to take it out of our hand so that he can fill our life with something else. See, Isaac was a blessing. And now God says, I want you to release your blessing to me. And if you don't release your blessings to the Lord, he says, my blessings will become a curse. So when he says, I give this to you, he wants us to freely give what he has blessed us with. That's why I've been talking so much about being generous, not being hoarder. Don't let that spirit get on you. That's the spirit of the world. That's not the spirit of Christ. Be generous. Be a giver. Be who the Lord wants you to be. So Abraham offers a son. He releases the blessing. And God says, now that you've released that to me, I give it back to you. And I got even more for you. Because you were willing to trust me. Man, that's exciting to me. Because there's people right now that are losing a lot of stuff. Stuff that have been blessings of God to this point. But if you release it to the Lord, he can add something greater. Remember the divine upgrade. I'm perfecting you. So let me add something divine to your life. So the divine upgrade for Abraham was let Isaac go. And then I'll return him back to you, and I'll bless you beyond what you've ever imagined. That's pretty cool. When God presses the pause button, I bet Abraham was glad when God pressed the pause button and said, don't kill your son. And uh, I know that we're glad when God stops us. Or at least we can be if we come into his presence. Okay, here's another verse. There's in Luke chapter 7, another time where Jesus hits the pause button, and uh, it's, it's a funeral procession, and it's a widow's only son, and Jesus interrupts the weeping, and interrupts the funeral, and it almost seems to be, in a way, rude. They're weeping. This is her only son, and you're saying, he literally stopped and said, don't weep. Well, hello there, my son is dead, mister. It's my only son. And Jesus says, well, she didn't say that, but obviously that could have been some thoughts of those around them, saying, who does this guy think he is? Why is he doing this? And that's the same thing we do with God. Well, who does God think he is? My life was pretty good a week ago. He's your Lord. You've entrusted your life to him. Guess what? Even if the world as there's bulk of the population walking away from God and rebelling against him. It doesn't make God not God. He's still in control. Why did, God, why did Jesus stop the funeral procession? Because he was about to bring new life into the boy. Why does he pause things in our life? He has a divine upgrade, and he wants to bring new life. I'm convinced of this, and it can happen in your life, no matter how rocky it gets right now, it can happen in your life and my life if we abide in the secret place of the Most High. I've been saying Psalm 91 for at least three weeks now. The secret place is Jesus. The reason you want to take this time to consecrate yourself to the Lord is because most of us don't. We watch TV all night long. Well, I'm tired. I worked hard. I, I'm just going to play this internet game so I can check out for a while. 
but we never check back in with the Lord. We just kind of hope that he blesses us and takes care of us. But he says, I want more than that from you and for you. I want to put beautiful things into your life. The way your life is today, the way it was two weeks ago, God says, I've got something better than you can even imagine. But you've got to trust me. Let go and let me resurrect. Let go and let me bring new life and new blessing. There's one other scripture I wrote down, and it's from Acts chapter 9. And it was about the guy named Saul. Saul is going about persecuting the church, and there's even been people that have died. He's throwing men and women. He doesn't care. He's indiscriminate children. Throw them in jail. If they're Christians, let's eradicate them. And he's riding on the road to Damascus, and as he's on the road... A great light shines about him. He ends up on his back. He ends up blind. But in that conversation, God speaks to him and says, Why are you kicking against me? Why are you fighting against me? And he said, Who are you? And he says, I'm Jesus whom you persecute. Now this is, this is interesting. Because when God starts to move in our life and say, Pause. And we say, I'm paused. And God says, pause, and we say, unpause. Why are you fighting against me? Why are you? I am the Lord. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus. I'm the Lord, and you're fighting me right now. Let me bring about a change in this world, Saul. Be part of the team that is victorious, not a team that's trying to eradicate my children. So in our life, this is what we do, though, because we don't want God to pause it. We go, hey, I'm so busy, I'm about to fall flat. I'm so busy, I'm going to have a nervous breakdown. Ah, I'm so stressed out. But don't press pause. I can't press pause. God says, I can. Watch me. And then we say, well, how, how am I going to come into the presence of God and let him get the poison out of you? The poison of stress. The poison of fear. That's what David had to do back in Psalm 3. We started with that. Many there be that are troubling me. They're all around me. What am I going to do? They even say there's no help for me and you, God. What am I going to do? Pause. Be in his presence. I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me out of his holy hill. I laid down and slept and awoke. And he sustained me. He'll sustain you too. And so Paul, Saul is, I know it's Saul, Paul, and I won't go into the reasons for why the name is that. But the Apostle Paul, God hits the pause button, he ends up on his back, and he becomes a radical Christian for the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, he wrote so much in the New Testament, he traveled a lot of the known world sharing the gospel. Why? Because God hit the pause button in his life and transformed him. And so I'm saying in your life, Right now, God has pressed the pause button in my life. He's pressed the pause button. It's not easy. I have things on my desk right now that we, the church, we've already paid for. And we've already planned to do. But we can't do them. And so, I look at it. And I, you know, in my flesh, I say, why? But I have to hear God say, pause. Because there's been times in my life this year. Where I said out loud, I can't do this. I can't do all this. I'm getting wore out. I'm getting frazzled. I'm getting angry. Pause. Why do I need to? Because I need the presence of God. You need the presence of God. And we need a lot more of it than what we've experienced. And the way to do that now is to be the church that we always talk about you being and me being and bring Jesus into your home and bring him into your family and your workplace. If you only watch Bugs Bunny or whatever the Thomas the Train stuff with your kids now and try to shoo them away because now they're home and they're on top of you and they're not school, if all you do is shoo them away with electronics, you're missing the pause button that God has given you. Remember what Satan means for evil God says, yeah, but watch, I'm going to work this for good. I'm going to give you time to do something you have been neglecting or maybe you've never done. Don't kick against me. Receive my presence, Paul, and receive my presence, body of Christ, 
in America and around the world come into my presence in a new way. There's a lot of churches out there that have a lot of plans, and we have laid them out, we're prepared for them, all that stuff, and God says, pause. Now, it's not that we didn't pray, and that the plans weren't good plans and things like that. I'm not saying that. But when God presses pause, he presses pause. And he says, come on now. I want you to come into the secret place a little bit closer to me. So that's what I wrote down. And I, I did write down a note, since I'm here and I'm at church, drove over here from my house. This is one of the ways to pause. How do you get the presence of God in? There's a story in 2 Samuel where David brings the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the capital of Israel. He wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant back from the outskirts to the center of Israel's life in Jerusalem. And they'd already tried once and somebody died in the process because they did it the wrong way. But this time David did it differently. The Levites took the Ark of the Covenant on their shoulders and they walked. And it says this. Now this is not what God said you have to do this. But this is what David did just to make sure they were handling the presence of God with the right kind of reverence, joy, and awe that we ought to. Every six steps, they paused the procession. I never have been able to find out the distance between Obed-Edom's house, where the Ark of the Covenant was, to Jerusalem. I don't know if it was a mile or 25 miles, I don't know. But every six steps, they would stop, and they would offer sacrifice, and they would praise the Lord. That must have taken a long time, regardless of the distance. And they finally bring the Ark of the Covenant back, and David is shouting and praising the Lord. And I just want you to get this. They were bringing the presence of God in, and in order to do it properly and make sure they weren't missing anything, because last time somebody died, every six steps, they stopped. You and I, how often do we stop? How often do we pause for the presence of God? Maybe Sunday morning. Maybe some people have an established time of prayer. Maybe some do this daily. But I know the majority, the majority of us do not pause and get in the presence of God every day. So now we can pause. If you're working still, thank God that you're still working. Profess and proclaim Psalm 91 over yourself when you come and when you go. But you still have to hit the pause button and get into the presence of God. Don't just flop when you go home. Get in the presence of God. Now I want to close with this. It's from 2 Chronicles. Now you know this. It's 2 Chronicles 7 and 14. We have a prayer group that's called the 714 Prayer Warriors. And there's a lot of people in that group. There's people here in Michigan and outside of Michigan. People in our church and some not. Graham, you're going to have to come up here and read this because, man, this print is way too small for me and it's too dark. So he's not dressed nearly as snazzy as I am. A little more clothes. But you want to look at verse 13, wherever that is over here. 713? Yeah. And look at those guys and read 713. And, and 14. Yes. So, when I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain or command locusts to devour the land or send a plague among my people... If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins, and I will heal their, their land. Amen. So, thank you, buddy. So that, I just want you to notice that, because we know 714. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, Turn from their wicked ways. That's God's people he's talking to. God's people turn from your wicked ways. That's Jim included. And get into my presence. Call on me. I'll heal your land. But the preceding verse, verse 13, says when there's a drought, when there's a plague, when there's locusts. And, you know, I, did, you know, I forgot about it with all that's happening in America. But there's a huge 
plague of locusts that's uncontrollable in Africa right now that is devouring huge swaths of land. And now there's a pestilence or a plague that's sweeping the nation, or our nation and the globe. And God says, if that happens, if you cry out to me, I will hear from heaven and heal your land. People of God, we need to be a people of his presence. You might remember a few weeks ago, or months ago probably, I said we are not purpose-driven, we are presence-driven people. You can have a purpose, but if you don't get in the presence of God, you're not going to achieve that purpose in a godly manner. So, be presence-driven now. Come into the presence of God. The word of God that I'm sharing with you tonight, you can remember it, is pause. And the pause is something God has brought. And what God desires is for you to stop every six steps. I'm not saying that literally, but frequently throughout your day and give him praise and give him glory. When you read the word of God, pause. Don't try. Well, I read the whole book of Deuteronomy today. I, I read the whole book of Revelation. Okay, great. But pause. What did you get out of it? Because I want you to read the whole Bible, but you can spend your life studying a couple verses, and God can keep on and keep on and keep on giving you more and more. Just, I'm not saying you should, but that's how God is. So don't just read to read. Pause. Do not just sing praises out of your mouth. Well, I put on the radio and I was singing, you know, whatever. I turned on YouTube and I was singing with Bethel or I was singing with the Pentecostal choir and I was just praising, you know. Okay, but did you pause or, or did you just do dishes the whole time? Did you pause and say, what am I saying? How am I saying it to the Lord? Did you pause with your family? Fathers, you need to invoke blessing on your children. Do you know one of the biggest things women where Christians desire when they're married is for their husband to pray with them? And most husbands say, oh no, that's something we should do in private. And that's one of the number one things women want when they're married to Christian men is for you to pause and pray with them. You need to lay your hands on your kids and say, you're a blessing. You're a gift of God. The Lord has a great plan and a great purpose for your life. You can show them things in the Bible. Why do you say that, Dad? Because the Bible says it here. Children are a gift from the Lord. You can look that one up. And so this is a time for you to pause, be in the presence of God, and then bring the presence of God with you. Just like David did, they brought the presence of God with them back to Jerusalem. Man, that's what we want in our life. I pray this bless you. I pray that it helps you. Father, in the name of Jesus, bless everybody tonight as they receive the word. And let every one of us hit pause in our life and be in your presence in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Before you shut it off, remember Unite714.com is a great prayer site. It's a global prayer site, Unite714. The Lord bless you. I won't be on tomorrow. I'll probably put something out on Friday. But tomorrow I'm just going to rest myself and be in the presence of the Lord as much as I can. I love you all. Stay connected through phone calling. And if you need something, you, you can call. We have people out there willing to, to do things for you to try to help you. We have food at the church. If you know somebody that needs food, we have food here. We love you. God bless you. See you soon.